12 months ago, I had a cycling accident. I was participating in a relay cycling race on an outdoor running track. I can't tell you exactly what happened, how or why I crashed. I don't remember. All I do recall is that I banked to turn the corner, but something went wrong. Something went wrong and I lost control of my bike. And with it, control of my mind and body. And for a brief and terrifying moment, I was suspended in a surreal state of serenity as the railings of the lower grandstand in front of me rushed towards me, or rather, I towards them. The aftermath wasn't pretty, far from it, to be honest. But I was alive, conscious, and able to walk and talk. I suffered 28 road rash burns, two chipped teeth, a small chin fracture, two displaced jaw joint discs, and a mild concussion. Yet, pain of the physical injuries aside, I remember being confused at this diagnosis. A mild concussion? I was wearing a helmet. I still knew my name, and I could tell you how many fingers you were holding up. So what did it even mean to have a concussion? At that point, I thought the burns and the fractures, the visible physical injuries, were the worst part. Unfortunately, I couldn't have been more wrong. In the weeks that followed, my burns and fractures healed, but my brain did not. Now, this may sound strange for those of you who have never experienced a concussion or don't really know what that means, because there's this pretty common misconception that concussions are just a low-key, short-term thing. You know, you get a knock on the head, maybe see some stars, Take a week or two off, and alas, you're good to go. But unfortunately, that outcome is often far from reality. A concussion is a traumatic brain injury. All concussions are traumatic brain injuries. And although some concussions are less serious than others, no concussion is a minor injury. And contrary to popular belief, you do not have to suffer multiple concussions or have visible brain damage to experience very significant short and long-term neurocognitive effects, a fact that I found out firsthand. Now, it is true that for most people, symptoms do resolve in the first two to three weeks. However, for approximately 10% of concussion sufferers, this is not the case. For them, Concussion symptoms can sometimes last for months or even years with what is known as post-concussion syndrome. And this can include anxiety, depression, irritability, personality changes, insomnia, memory and concentration problems, in addition to more common symptoms such as headaches and dizziness. Although, like all concussions, these symptoms vary from person to person and both develop and fluctuate over time. And as such, there is no defined recovery period or process, diagnosis or treatment for post-concussion syndrome. Well, as it turned out, I was one of those lucky 10%. I experienced a concussion, my first and only concussion, and from this, I'm now suffering from post-concussion syndrome. And to be totally honest, that's difficult for me to stand up here and say. It's difficult for me to talk about what that really means, about what it feels like to not understand what's happening to you and to realise that no one around you does either. It's difficult because not only is post-concussion syndrome misunderstood and entirely invisible, there's a stigma attached to it. It involves mental health. And thus, many are worried to talk about how deeply it affects them because they do not want to be associated with this stigma. They do not want to be perceived as weak or as broken for not bouncing back from their head injury as if nothing ever happened. 
They do not want to be accused of making their symptoms up due to the lack of visible diagnostic evidence or left on the sideline and forgotten because now they're a liability. Now they're damaged goods. But because of this silence, because of this collective misunderstanding, post-concussion syndrome is becoming an increasingly severe problem. In the United States, from 2010 to 2015, there was a 43% increase in concussion diagnoses and an 81% increase in post-concussion syndrome. However, not only are diagnoses on the rise, the effects from suffering even a single mild concussion are far more devastating than we previously realised. A Canadian study published in 2016 showed that adults from the general community, not professional athletes or military personnel, but people like you and like me, who suffer just a single mild concussion, are more than three times as likely to commit suicide in the years following. And whilst we don't yet understand the exact reasons behind this association, the increased risk of suicide was found to be independent of demographics or previous psychiatric conditions, and increased again and again by 30% with each additional concussion sustained. Yet, this is not on the list of symptoms that we're told to look out for when we experience a concussion. So, months after my accident, when I found myself overcome by negative, self-destructive thoughts, feelings and emotions completely foreign to me, memories about my accident and all that had and hadn't happened since, I was terrified. I was terrified and I was confused. I didn't know what was happening to me. I didn't know what to do. No one warned me I might feel this way. And I couldn't understand how such a deep and dark psychological and emotional turmoil could stem from one head injury. I was embarrassed. I was ashamed. I felt like a failure. I felt like I had failed at the one and only thing that truly mattered. I had failed to get better. Now, at this point, in all honesty, I had tanked for a while. A long while. I was exhausted. I was mentally and physically exhausted. And I didn't know when, if ever, this would all end. If I would ever feel like myself again. But that's the reality with post-concussion syndrome. For some people, it's a month, and for others, it's years. And there's really no way to know or predict where you'll fall on that spectrum. So, as the months wore on and my recovery stagnated, I found it harder and harder to keep on going. I struggled to recognise myself anymore. The person who I had once been, the witty, energetic, confident young woman everyone knew me to be, seemed nowhere to be found. And with it, my entire sense of self, previously tied to the successful student-athlete I'd always prided myself on, had vanished too. I felt empty. I felt lost. Growing up, I'd always been identified by others as academic, and as sporty. If I wasn't in class or studying, I was running, dancing, swimming, in the gym. So when my newfound difficulties with memory and concentration impacted my ability to study and retain information, and when my headaches, fatigue and dizziness limited my ability to exercise beyond walking, it really didn't take long for the depression, anxiety, and frustration to set in. And furthermore, my partial resumption of college life had led people to forget that I was still injured. To them, me being here meant that I'd recovered and was back to normal. There was this expectation, 
this underlying pressure that because I looked fine, I should be fine. And to me, the guilt from that meant that I had to stay silent and apologize for my injury. I became distant, detached. I minimized my pain and my struggles because as I quickly learned, confiding in my friends only seemed to push them away. They felt held back by my limitations and weighed down by my frustrations. And as a result, my friendships deteriorated and my relationships became superficial. I became this person that everyone knew, but that no one ever saw anymore. Because the truth was, the ignorance and the resulting insensitivity of many people around me was almost as frustrating as my seemingly stagnant and non-linear recovery. The constant reminders were debilitating. Reminders of the now versus the then. Reminders of the discrepancy between where I was and where I wanted to be. Comments like, aren't you better already? And when are you gonna stop playing the concussion card? We're each another stab in an already open bloody wound. Unwelcome reminders that I really should have been better, but I wasn't. Yet, as challenging, frustrating, and agonizing as this past year has been, eventually things did get better, much better. I found hope again through a friend who stood by me unjudgingly, even through the worst of times. And I found new passions to satisfy my inner athlete that didn't aggravate my symptoms, such as yoga and rock climbing. And to be honest, that's the reality of concussions and post-concussion syndrome. One day, you do wake up feeling better. And you won't necessarily know when that day will come. For some people, it might take a lot longer than for others. But once it does come, over time, that one day will turn into two and three and so forth. Now, don't let my experiences scare you. Not everyone who suffers a concussion will go through what I did. And to be honest, statistically speaking, the chances are you won't. However, if you do, know that it's okay. If you or someone you know is suffering from post-concussion syndrome or another invisible injury, know that you're okay. And know that you're not alone. Know that you're injured. You're not weak or broken. So, if there's one thing I'd like you to leave this talk with, it's this. I want you to leave this talk knowing that just because you can't see it, just because it isn't visible on medical scans, does not mean it's not real or that it's any less of an injury. Just because it's invisible doesn't mean it's no big deal. We're people. We're people and we get injured. And we get visible injuries and we get invisible injuries. And that's okay. That's okay. So, so we need awareness. We need empathy. We need to end the stigma. We need to create a safe space so people can reach out and speak up. Because the only remedy for invisible injuries, the solution to the misunderstanding and isolation, is to stand strong together. Thank you.